Hi everyone, welcome to LSE for today's event hosted by the European Institute. I'm Sinju Rukao and I'm fellow in European Political Economy and European Institute. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Andrew Clapper and Tim Blanders to LSE today and also to be joined by my other colleagues, uh, Robert Bistol, John Arty, as well as uh, Mark Sachin to launch this amazing book, Foreign Space in Domestic Markets. And I'm also very delighted to welcome our online audience and audience here. So, just to clarify a bit more, um, I would like to ask you to hold your, uh, put your phone on silent so as not to disrupt the event. This event is being recorded and you are hopefully be made available on the podcast if there are no technical difficulties hopefully. So as you know, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to our panelists. So for our online audience, you can just submit your question via the Q&A section uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Please also include your name and affiliation. And for those who are here already, I would like to know when we open the floor for questions. Please just raise your hand and also please, uh, let us know your name and your speech. Now, without further ado, I will just uh, introduce our panelists a little bit more. We've got uh, five speakers. Uh, let's start with Andrew uh, Klaza. She is an answered management reporter at the Financial Times. She is a World Desk Digital Editor, focusing on digital uh, innovation and virtual journalism. Previously, she was a reporter and editor and at school publications. This is Africa, the banker and the FBI. And then we got um, Mark uh, Thatcher who is a visiting professor at the European Institute, LSE, and a professor of politics, Department of Political Science, Lewis University, No, His research interests include comparative public policy, regulation in, and regulation in Europe. He has worked on the governance of markets, development of national and EU regulatory agencies, policies on network industries, general, application policy and neoliberalism. And then um, we also have uh, Tim Vendas with us today. Uh, he's a associate professor in the Department of Social Policy and fellow in St. Anthony's College, both at the University of Oxford. He holds a PhD in European Political Economy from LCE. His major area includes uh, comparative political economy with a particular interest in the relationship between electoral politics, public policy, and social economic outcomes. And we also got John Hartley here, uh, who is a visiting professor in practice at the European Institute. His career has been spent a lot in government, uh, working on regulation, markets, and business issues with a strong EU and international dimension. And we got Robert Bristol, who is an excellent, uh, a assistant professor for international political economy and LSE. His research covers international trade and investment policy. Before joining LSE, he was an international civil servant and uh, OECD in Paris. And has, he has also worked as policy consultant for European institutions and German government. So here's the um, introduction of everyone. So uh, later we we'll, we are going to start with the brief introductory remarks given by Andrew. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Nikhil, um, for being here, and to people listening online. Um, I'm going to give some general remarks um, and then I will leave it to our authors to go into greater depth um, on their research. Um, but the context for what we're talking about today is that over the past three decades, foreign direct investment has risen steadily around the world. Um, and even following the big knock that we've seen from the coronavirus pandemic, um, now cross-border investment has picked up uh, and surpassed pre-pandemic levels. 
In an increasingly globalist, uh, capitalist, globalized capitalist world, it might be easy to conclude that the role of the state has diminished. However, the findings of this book um, tally with my experience as a financial reporter, which is that while the state might appear to have diminished power relative to some giant uh, international corporations, many are actually powerful investors in their own rights and have found other avenues through which to exert their dominance and to find ways to um, assert their policy prerogatives. Um, along with pension funds and state-owned companies, uh, sovereign wealth funds have grown to steward trillions of dollars. Um, and many of them have grown substantially, uh, both in number and in the amount of capital that they manage in the past, I would say, decade or two. Um, they are also, and this is a key point, uh, among the top clients of leading financial, financial institutions with huge influence in Wall Street and the city of London. Uh, the growth of sovereign wealth funds presents a, a Western policymakers with an interesting paradox, however. These funds are often seen as important sources of long-term capital. They are ideally matched to ambitious redevelopment and infrastructure projects. Um, their time horizons align with those kinds of projects, whereas many other kinds of investors want a quicker turnaround on their, on their investments. At the same time, uh, many of the largest sovereign wealth funds uh, investors come from non-democratic countries. Um, and while most are ostensible, if not uncon uncontroversial allies, such as Saudi Arabia, others like China's CIC come from countries increasingly at odds with Western political and economic, economic object objectives. Excuse me. Understanding how sovereign wealth funds invest and their policy objectives um, and how they might help their home states advance them is crucial for decision makers in the West as they decide how to engage with these entities. The attitudes of recipient countries are also in flux, most no notably in the US where policymakers have adopted an increasingly closed attitude uh, towards some investors, particularly those who have been perceived to be linked to the Chinese state. I'm sure you all remember the Trump era stories um, about that, but there are also many other examples. Um, how should policymakers manage these relationships? How should they balance the advantages and risks um, that these vast pools of capital represent? Um, foreign states and domestic markets provides a new perspective on these key long-term trends. And without further ado, I will pass it off to the authors. Thank you, um, Adrienne. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues. And uh, thanks especially to the European Institute for hosting this event today. Uh, my name is Tim Landers, and uh, together with my co author, uh, Mark Thatcher, we'll be presenting um, some of the core arguments and findings of the book. So, although hopefully not, not sufficiently uh, that you're not left with a desire to uh, you know, perhaps have a look at the book uh, itself. Uh, we've presented the, the project many times. It's, uh, it's been eight years in the making, uh, but it's only the third or fourth time we present the finished product. The book just came out in December 2021. Um, and in this talk, what we'd like to do is to just walk you through the, the core parts of the arguments um, and uh, most especially the ways in which recipient states find it uh, appealing and attractive to welcome what are in some ways very controversial um, funds. And so what, what we'll do is uh, cover the sort of first half and the question argument and the sort of empirical approach, and then Mark uh, will walk you through um, the findings in a second step. Let me just try if I can make this. Um, so um, the starting point is the rise of state internationalization that Adrienne uh, just mentioned in her introductory remarks. And the reason why that's interesting is because there's a large literature showing indeed that states intervene in markets. That's not so, so new. And there's a lot of uh, studies showing that private capital also crosses frontiers in various kinds of ways. And recipient states must uh, react to these uh, private actors. And uh, we know that they do so in ways that direct from particular sectors and away from others. What's a, a bit less uh, looked at and a bit newer is the phenomenon of rising state internationalization. You have all sorts of very prominent public actors increasingly using the internationalization that was uh, in the past dominated by private actors to themselves as state actors cross frontiers and enter jurisdictions of other 
um, of other uh, states. Just to give you a couple of uh, examples to, to fix ideas, you've got 400 public development banks now around the world. You, of course, have public pension funds, which are crossing uh, frontiers and investing uh, assets elsewhere. Uh, they're worth about $18 trillion. You've got um, state-owned um, enterprises also increasingly operating uh, and investing abroad. I mean, there's the case of EDF, uh, the French uh, you know, electricity maker, investing and owning parts of the British network. Similarly, you've got Deutsche Bahn, uh, that's also mentioned, but also uh, non-Western actors such as Sinopec and the, the Chinese oil and gas firms. So a number of different uh, public actors are crossing frontiers and uh, becoming more prominent, and so not surprisingly, we're not the first people to, uh, to look at those, uh, but by and large, the literature looks at uh, why these uh, actors are created, how they invest, what kind of effects they have in the recipient economies in which they invest, but not so much how policymakers react to these foreign states entering the markets. And so in this book, we ask how the states react to these funds investing domestic markets, but more particularly, what kinds of policies, instruments, and legislation do they adopt to manage uh, these new actors? And what explains variation across time and countries in the ways that a recipient states uh, react uh, to these funds? So our focus, as was uh, mentioned uh, already, is towards sovereign wealth funds doing equity investments. And in a sense, this represents relatively hard uh, case because uh, they are often based in non-democratic non countries, perhaps in some cases even geopolitical competitors. And so it raises all sorts of questions about how um, states react to these actors entering the markets. And to develop, to, to, to make sense of uh, this phenomenon, we develop um, the concept of internationalized statism, which is putting the emphasis on how states use these funds strategically to govern the domestic economy. And that helps us make sense of a puzzle about why these funds are welcomed and actively attracted in so many instances when one might have thought that perhaps they uh, would uh, elicit uh, reactions that are more negative. So let me just tell you a few uh, words about uh, what these funds are. So you can see a definition up there. I'm not going to read it, but I just want to direct you to two salient features of this definition. Number one, public ownership. Number two, investing abroad, right? So public ownership is not sufficient. If you have actors that are just investing domestically, they do not qualify as sovereign wealth funds. And conversely, actors crossing frontiers investing abroad, that's not enough, you need public ownership. They often have other features such as not having significant liabilities like pension funds do, for instance. But uh, what's interesting about these funds is that they often uh, based in uh, Asia and the Middle East, part of a recentering of uh, economic development away from the West and towards a new center of gravity. Just to give you a few key metrics, uh, which you can also see in the graph. Um, in the 1990s, you had 21 sovereign wealth funds. In 2030, 2010, 60, and today you have more than 75. It's not just a numerical growth. If you look at assets, you get a similar picture. In 1990, sovereign wealth funds were worth $1 trillion. By 2005, $3 trillion. And in 2019, $8 trillion. How large is that? Well, hedge funds are $1.3 trillion, private equity 0 0.8. So they're not insignificant investors. Given the growing size and numbers and the growing activities, they've been heavily debated by both the literature and policymakers. And typically, you have this two dimensional space where you have some gains and some concerns, or some presumed benefits and some potential concerns along an economic and security. Um, uh, by dimensionality. So on the gain side, people argue that they're great because they have a stabilizing role, they're patient capital, they have a long-term view, they've been used to bail out banks during the crisis. Others on the more security side emphasize instead their uh, geopolitical benefits. You can get capital from allies, they're passive investors, in many cases, maybe they're unlikely to uh, meddle in your affairs. But others have worried quite significantly about the effects. Uh, Larry Summers, for instance, famously said that they shake the capitalist logic, and the argument is 
but the state actors are not following the logic of the market that might not be maximizing benefits and disciplining the board of companies to uh, maximize profits. And as a result, perhaps they led to inefficient investments, limited shareholders oversight. But you have even more geopolitical concerns that these funds are used to exert political influence. They're investing in strategic sectors. Perhaps they are attempting to steal technology. They lack transparency in some cases. And so the, the, the question is, how should you then conceptualize uh, these funds? And what we do here is we depart from two um, types of literature. One, a so-called new status literature focuses at state, on, on, at state strategies and argues that states are not passive recipients of internationalization, but instead they're able to shape the ways that they open markets in a strategic way. And that therefore perhaps with economic internationalization, you don't just get further constraints on states, you also get greater opportunities for shaping markets. And this literature is very valuable, but by and large, it has focused on private market actors and not so much on foreign state actors. On the other side, you have a literature looking at the state as, cross, uh, as a cross-border investor, which I alluded to earlier on. And it's a very interesting, it's showing just the, the scope and the extent of the phenomenon and uh, exploring the effects that these investments might have on economic performance and company performance, heavily debated in many ways, uh, but they haven't looked so much at the policy response towards these funds, which is what we do. So we're trying to bring these two literature in a sort of dialogue. And in doing so, we're especially interested in unpacking what different parts of the state do. So typically, you know, a lot of literature looks at the state as this unitary actor, but what we're saying is actually different parts of the state could have different positions, and indeed we find that they do, and could have a different strategies that they adopt in responding to these funds. And we especially um, focused in the book on how and why they promote particular preferences that they have, who wins, and how that then perhaps um, leads to particular policies and strategies being adopted <coughs> towards these funds. I'll just say a couple of brief words on research design or the empirical approach that we adopt uh, to explore our, our research question. Uh, what we try to do is we focus on non-Western sovereign wealth funds, equity investments as a hard case, as I mentioned earlier on, expecting when we started the project that these funds would be heavily repelled and uh, generate all sorts of worries, given what I mentioned. But in fact, what we found was actually these funds are often welcomed and even actively sought out. And so we explored um, a number of uh, policy responses in four countries, the UK, US, France, and Germany. Typically, these countries are seen as having similarly advanced and developed economies and democratic institutions, but they also vary in a number of prominent dimensions in comparative political economy, different types of capitalism in some ways, different political institutions, but also crucially different extents of stock market and financialization, right? So the needs for foreign capital is actually quite different. And then in terms of data and methods, we looked at a number of databases on a sovereign wealth funds investments to try and see what kinds of sectors and companies they invest in, but also newspapers and policy documents and debates in the assemblies and various other venues to try and see why and how uh, these funds are reacted to. Um, and we also had a number of in-depth uh, qualitative analysis, controlled comparisons and process tracing. I don't want to say too much uh, in the interest of time and keeping you fully engaged at this uh, late time of the day on the research design, but we're very happy to say more uh, in the Q&A. And I will now pass on to uh, my colleague Mark uh, to take over. Let me say something about the uh, central concept of internationalized statism. So, uh, uh, as Tim mentioned, th this is the idea that states use overseas states to govern their domestic markets. So it's statist in the sense that the state is trying to shape uh, uh, the domestic market. It's internationalized in the sense that the state is, is turning to overseas state actors. Um, and that's uh, uh, perhaps... Uh, uh, in sharp contrast to some of the ways that um, uh, uh, the state is usually seen. Um, we distinguish two dimensions. One is the degree of internationalized statism, 
the extent to which uh, domestic state turns to uh, overseas states. Um, and the other is the form, uh, whether or not the domestic state directs foreign state investment to particular companies and sectors, or whether or not uh, it looks for uh, uh, overseas state uh, investment uh, without such discrimination. Um, then we have kind of map, this allows us to, to map out our four countries. Um, United Kingdom, uh, as you can see, has a Wimbledon strategy. Um, so, you know, the Wimbledon uh, uh, tournament. Uh, Wimbledon attracts players from all over the world uh, uh, without discrimination, and British players almost never win. Um, so, uh, uh, no. as, many, as many foreign players as we can have, uh, but we're not going to select amongst them. Any, in, anyone uh, is welcome. Um, perhaps the opposite extreme is the United States, uh, where internationalized statism is, uh, has been highly contested. Uh, um, uh, and then France and Germany sit uh, uh, in a kind of intermediate position uh, where they, their policymakers seek uh, overseas uh, uh, state investment, uh, and there is a degree of direction. So let me say something a, a little bit more about a couple of these. I won't have time to go through all of them. Um, the United States, so the United States is often seen as a liberal market economy. Uh, but um, like many, many uh, appellations, it's incorrect, at least in this field. Um, the United States has seen a great deal of contest about uh, uh, how to respond to overseas state investment with uh, uh, battles uh, uh, between particularly Congress and the executive in the mid 2000s. Uh, there was a case, a very famous case called the Dubai Ports case, uh, in which uh, the Dubai, uh, uh, um, Dubai Ports World wanted to buy uh, the port facilities in uh, the United States. Uh, these were already foreign owned by a British company. Uh, as it happens, uh, Dubai is uh, and was one of uh, uh, America's closest allies in the Middle East. Uh, George Bush came in uh, and supported the, the acquisition, but uh, it became highly politicized and Congress became involved, uh, including uh, two important Congress people, Chuck Schumer and the then uh, 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 Senator for New York, Hillary Clinton, who opposed it. Uh, and all kinds of things were thrown uh, at Dubai ports uh, in, and Dubai, including uh, uh, links with 9-11. Absolutely no, 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 no evidence of this at all. Uh, and the result is that Congress passed resolutions and eventually a, a new act that made foreign investment uh, much more difficult. Dubai ports withdrew. Uh, um, uh, yeah. And uh, the Act uh, in 2007, the Foreign Investment uh, uh, Act, uh, said, for instance, that overseas state ownership in itself was a risk to national security. So the opponents were uh, uh, presenting overseas state investment as a security issue, uh, and the executive was trying to present it uh, as an economic issue. And increasingly, the United States has become restrictive. Uh, there's something called the Committee for Foreign Investment in, in the United States, CFIUS. Um, and today, almost all uh, uh, foreign state investment is uh, uh, scrutinized by CFIUS. And under the 2007 uh, Act, uh, uh, the criteria have become uh, much stricter. Um, so we see the United States so much more selective uh, insofar as it receives investment uh, from sort of wealth funds, it tends to be from certain countries, uh, Singapore, Norway, uh, but very little investment uh, from the Middle East uh, uh, or indeed uh, from China. At the opposite extreme, uh, the, the, the UK, again, which is often been labelled a liberal market economy, put in the same basket as the United States, had a very different approach. Um, United, the UK has given until recently very few powers to ministers to deal with foreign uh, state investment. Um, there is still no discrimination against in the legislation uh, uh, against foreign state investment. So, this being state owned is not a uh, uh, is not a, a grounds for uh, um, preventing an investment. Um, on the contrary, uh, Conservative uh, and Labour ministers and prime ministers have welcomed. Sovereign wealth funds into the heart of the British economy. So uh, uh, David Cameron uh, uh, said of the Chinese uh, uh, when they bought a, a chunk of Heathrow Airport, uh, 
uh, uh, I am proud that you are investing in Heathrow. And sovereign wealth funds own considerable stakes or have owned at different times because these things change uh, in sectors such as the stock exchange, London Stock Exchange, um, water companies, uh, uh, energy companies, uh, and uh, airports. And those are just, just, a, just a few examples. So uh, the, the Wimbledon strategy is uh, anyone can come in, you're all welcome. Uh, uh, we will not discriminate. Uh, we want uh, uh, the highest number of uh, sovereign wealth funds. In terms of the other two countries, let me just say something briefly about France. Um, so France is often labelled dirigiste, uh, uh, closed, uh, uh, etc., um, and it's often presented as being this kind of uh, economy that is uh, uh, hostile to foreign investment. That's just simply not true in terms of sovereign wealth funds. The French went out and sought sovereign wealth funds, uh, and they did so uh, using state instruments. So la Caisse de dépôt et consignation, uh, which is a state-owned bank, uh, went out and uh, formed uh, uh, partnerships with uh, overseas sovereign wealth funds from the Middle East uh, and from uh, China. Uh, sometimes the relationships were really very close, in particular, very close relationship uh, uh, between French uh, policymakers and the Qatari Investment Authority, um, uh, which made all kinds of investments uh, uh, in strategic industries, but also high-profile projects. Yeah? Um, they bought up some very prestigious buildings in Paris, uh, and uh, they even bought a, a share of uh, Saint-Germain, which reliable sources tell me is a football club. Um, uh, and these, these are, if you think of French prestige, et etc. Cetera, et cetera, the Qataris are in there, uh, welcomed by uh, um, French policy. Why has this happened? So the key factor we found in the end were uh, executive legislative uh, uh, relations. The legislature has, in all the countries that we've seen, been hostile or suspicious towards sovereign wealth fund investments. Right? But the difference has been how much power has it had to uh, have, its, uh, have its voice heard? So you know, in the US Congress, as, as we all know, is highly autonomous from the presidency. Um, even if they're the same party, uh, and indeed Congress was able to push through legislation and uh, restrictions. At the opposite extreme, uh, uh, the British Parliament, uh, except at rare occasions, has had it, found it very difficult to influence uh, this kind of economic policy making. So uh, uh, the British executive has been able to push through uh, its policy of, of welcoming sovereign wealth funds. Um, equally, parliaments in France and Germany so showed a degree of suspicion, uh, but eventually that was overcome by, by the executive. Why should the executive want to have foreign states in their home markets? And this comes to uh, questions of form. So the French, for instance, the French state and, and, and French policymakers were able to use the Qataris, for instance, for various kinds of, of personal uh, uh, policy and political advantages. So they were able to use the Qataris to rescue particularly favored companies or put capital into them, both state-owned companies and private companies. And because the relationship between French policymakers and French firms is very, very close. And in a sense, what the French were doing was updating some of their traditional industrial policies, right, in which you direct capital to particularly favored sectors and companies. The difference is that he was foreign state capital uh, rather than domestic capital. And they were able to engage in exchange relationships uh, uh, of various kinds, which were beneficial to French policymakers uh, 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 and, uh, and politicians. Britain, uh, in, in some ways, was recreating uh, its traditional policy of trying to attract foreign capital from all over the world. Uh, uh, Britain as, as, a, as a global uh, hub of, of capital. Uh, and it happens to be state capital, but uh, uh, that doesn't matter. The key point is that Britain needs, and the city of London uh, uh, needs to be at the center of global capital movements. So in a sense, uh, uh, it may be state capital, but each country is updating its traditional uh, 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 industrial policy. Uh, Germany uh, uh, directed 
uh, foreign uh, sovereign wealth fund capital towards uh, the industrial manufacturing sectors and uh, where it could do to small and medium-sized enterprises. So it's an opportunity for policymakers to update their industrial policy. So to conclude, um, what, what do we find? Um, first of all, I think the, the, to mention the, the striking extent of internationalized statism. When we started the project, we really did expect that there'd be a great deal more uh, public uh, resistance and a great more uh, a political debate. Right? That was true in the United States, but much less true in the other three countries. Um, and when there was political opposition, uh, it was uh, 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 overcome. Second thing that, that, we, that, that, we, that we find are these variations which run counter to the rather, rather popular views of uh, France as being closed, uh, 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 the United States as being liberal and, and open. Third uh, broad conclusion, the state is not dead. On the contrary, the state adapts to uh, uh, internationalized capital. It finds new allies. In this case, it finds a new source of capital uh, and new types of relationship. Uh, um, uh, in, in this case, uh, with foreign state capital. Um, and finally, we find that state action uh, um, updates. Right? We have whole literatures about uh, uh, industrial policy and state strategies in the 60s and 70s, and we find that these can be adapted to uh, 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 internationalized finance by finding a new source of finance. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Shall we have our thousand comments now? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Shishu. Thank you, Tim and Mark, for the opportunity to read uh, this book um, over the last years, actually. It's, uh, it's really a great read, and I very much recommend that you take a look if you can. Um, I now have the role to uh, outline all the benefits or the positive points, but also perhaps to suggest a few avenues for future research, um, uh, which I will try. So first of all, I think from my perspective, and I'm a specialist for trade and investment policy with a focus on the world economy rather than on comparative political economy, uh, which is, I think, your perspective. Um, mm -hmm. From my point of view, what it really fills is a massive theoretical and uh, empirical gap in the literature on domestic capitalist systems. So the varieties of capitalism literature, uh, which is very much focused, as you uh, already suggested, on this idea that the US is inherently liberal and the French and the Germans are inherently interventionist and, you know, kind of hostile to capitalists. That's, uh, um, that's very deep rooted in this literature on the rights of capitalism. Um, and you clearly show that this is really not the truth uh, uh, when we look at the facts. Really. And you have a nice conceptual framework to understand uh, what is actually happening here. Um, so that is great. Uh, I also think empirically it's a really uh, a great uh, tour d'horizon, you could say, because there's really not a lot on, uh, on sovereign wealth funds out there. I mean, I don't know to what extent you have actually looked into this. The academic literature is quite limited, um, and this book really fills a significant gap. So anybody who wants to research this now has a book. It will show up in all Google searches and library searches, and we have a great source to, uh, to look what actually key countries are doing here. Um, uh, also, what I thought was very uh, um, uh, helpful is this notion of, of statism, and especially that you actually really put the emphasis on the state as a key actor here. You know, the, the state directs sovereign wealth fund investment, uh, also uh, is to different degrees open to this kind of foreign capital. And I, I think this very much resonates with the general tendencies of today, right? If we look around what is happening in the world economy, it is really a backlash against markets, you could argue. The state's coming back very powerfully interfering. Uh, I'm not sure you all agree with that, but I would at least um, uh, look at it like this. But I, I'm a specialist for EU policy, and what we see in the EU is a, really a flurry of instruments how the EU would like to intervene uh, in, in global markets now. So this focus on the state as a causal determinant of how we deal with notably this type of capital is really uh, helpful. Now, on suggestions. 
how, how you could improve uh, this. I think that's obviously a very touchy thing because you worked on this for 10 years now, so you probably don't want to touch this book or this topic in any way. Uh, I very much appreciate this, but I, I, you know, as academics, we have to be really smart and show that we're really smart and you never have these ideas or we just suggest these ideas that you never have probably. Um, so what are these ideas uh, that I had when reading this? Um, I think the first and major comment I would make is this book was 10 years in the making, and I think the empirical research stopped about two years ago. And uh, luckily, actually, the topic of state intervention um, has become much more prominent, right, uh, in, in world markets and how we deal with foreign investors. But unfortunately, the world has really moved on a lot, I think. Um, I mean, I, for instance, was uh, at a conference two weeks ago on FDI screening mechanisms for how states actually interfere in, uh, in markets and screen foreign direct investments for security and competition issues, for instance. And really, pretty much all OECD economies do this now. And um, I would say, uh, how I think the key point to make here is like sovereign wealth funds are one particular way or one particular entity or type of investor. But what states now have created are horizontal instruments that allow them to screen pretty much any kind of investment coming in in the form of state owned enterprises, in the form of even private investment funds that may be close to the states in some countries. So um, yeah, screening uh, has really taken over, and some of our funds have basically become secondary issues to some extent, I think, for policymakers, for me, put it that harshly, because it's only one way how this menace of foreign capital that may endanger, uh, that may endanger national security is occurring in the minds of policymakers. So the world has moved on empirically to some extent, and I think if you want to turn this into articles, I would encourage you to kind of connect this to these more recent developments <laughs> developing FDI screening mechanisms. Um, another uh, thought that I had when I read the book um, over the last few weeks uh, was, I do appreciate that there's a causal argument and you also presented it like this, but it comes quite late in the book. And I would very much uh, um, encourage you to, if you continue working on this, to spell out much earlier in the research what actually drives variation, how states intervene. It, it reads uh, very nicely, and, uh, but it's very inductive. And it's very much at the end, even in the appendix, actually, that you now then show uh, economic statistics that may actually shed a light on why variation is happening, such as uh, the, well, the size of capital markets and things alike. Uh, this leads me to uh, one of my last comments. Namely, I was really curious to see uh, and hear from you whether you would explain actually what we are seeing in terms of variation of openness for several wealth funds between the US and the EU uh, or European countries. Is that mostly driven by the US being basically the preeminent financial uh, and capital market in the world and uh, Europeans being desperate to get a little bit of capital, basically? Is that what we are seeing here in your point of view? Um, it's kind of in the book, but um, I would like to encourage you to spell it out a bit more clearly. Um, yeah, I think those were the, the, <laughs> the annoying comments I had to make, and I'm happy to, to, uh, to discuss that. Thank you very much for, for reading, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. 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 Thank you particularly uh, at your analysis in the UK, um, and uh, just offer some observations on that, um, which may have some wider ramifications too. So uh, I thought it was a very comprehensive uh, survey of uh, the UK's approach uh, from, as you said, about the mid-90s to the mid-2010s. Um, and as you mentioned, I mean, the Wimbledon strategy, uh, it's not very... Surprising that has been the UK's overall approach to inward investment. Um, so, uh, from one point of view, uh, why wouldn't it apply in this case? I think the interesting thing for the UK, and bearing in mind the UK government's over that period, is that it is, as you say, uh, state, uh, either state owned enterprises or in this case sovereign wealth funds, state capital. 
and um, in many cases that has been invested in companies or, or organisations that have been privatised by the UK government and where the UK had taken a strong position that these sorts of things should be uh, run uh, in market and according to market rules. Um, so that for me is the most interesting aspect of, of the UK uh, chapter. Um, and I'd just offer a few additional comments. Um, first, um, and you mentioned this in your book, there were some quite um, serious political um, efforts to question not so much sovereign wealth funds because they hadn't got going at that point, uh, but certainly state-owned enterprise takeovers, uh, which I had the pleasure of working on uh, at the time. So under the Conservative government in the 1990s, uh, the, the relevant, the competent or the responsible ministers um, tried to stop uh, take, these takeovers. Um, and as you mentioned, they didn't have that many um, powers, but they tried to ensure they were investigated thoroughly and um, maybe give out signals they weren't very welcome. Um, however, this died away. Um, it died away for two reasons. First, um, that um, uh, many of these investments, as you mentioned, were by companies by EDF, like EDF, um, and within the EU framework, uh, that caused problems. Uh, so we had problems with the European Commission. But also because actually when they, these scrutinies and these investigations happened, that the competition authorities didn't find anything wrong with the purchases. Uh, and on competition grounds, it would be difficult to, in many cases, to see what the problem would be. So they didn't have the, the levers to do it. And they certainly weren't rushing, uh, as has happened later, I'll come back to, to have this screening of all investment, which would be a complete turnaround in, in UK policy. I think there are some other reasons why, uh, after that, um, the concerns uh, were low. First, the governments were less ideologically um, uh, committed. So uh, we got the Labour government, uh, which didn't have the same view. Uh, it had a pro-market view, but it didn't have the same uh, distinct view about private and public uh, actors. Um, and then uh, even the uh, Cameron government, uh, which was actually a coalition government with the Dems up until 2015, didn't either, and, and the relevant minister uh, was actually a Lib Dem minister. Um, so uh, the, the, that um, ideological issue uh, largely went away. And also, I would say that um, one of the sort of driving concerns um, about uh, leading to the privatisation, certainly the early privatisations, was concerned that um, the government had to fund these industries um, that these industries were politicised uh, because they were owned by the state. The state was the ultimate guarantor, the UK state. And none of these issues apply to um, uh, overseas uh, state investors. Um, so um, some of the reasons that, that sort of the government wished to get out of this area um, only apply in terms of their <coughs> by the UK state. Two other points uh, I would make um, on your sort of analysis uh, and your, your framework uh, and the UK as a statist, international status um, government, if you like, or country. Um, I mean, first, um, I think the UK has always um, seen itself as in competition for investment with other countries and has had um, various mechanisms to try and attract and actively, as you said, um, uh, investment of various sorts, and in this case, sovereign wealth funds. And the latest manifestation of that is the Office for Investment, which was set up quite recently uh, with the Prime Minister's office directly as a way of sort of beating it up further. So that's... That's always been, um, the, you know, the, the UK has never been laissez-faire in terms of trying to get foreign investment in. And then the other point, which was the sort of contrast with France, uh, where you, in the book you, you explain uh, the French were more um, 
uh, directed in the way that they use these funds. And I think uh, it's certainly true that um, uh, I'm not trying to um, put uh, particular companies in the way of, uh, of sovereign wealth funds. Um, there's been a general sort of debate over uh, the last uh, several decades about what I call horizontal and vertical industrial policy. So horizontal is sort of competition policy, but also um, innovation policy, which doesn't doesn't need to discriminate between different sectors or actors, and then vertical, more sort of sectoral policies, which the UK has always practiced to a degree. So it's always supported the aerospace industry or the bioscience industry, for instance, the life sciences industry. So I think you have seen a bit of both of those. And, and if you look at some of the announcements recently in relation to sovereign wealth funds, um, they don't identify companies, but they do identify sectors where they uh, want to encourage and, and in fact jointly invest um, uh, 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 for, for this long-term growth. And finally, um, I just echo uh, what Robert was saying um, that, uh, um, Although this book is pretty up to date, uh, the changes that have happened since, um, for instance, the Chinese would definitely not uh, be uh, or are not welcome in investing in the UK nuclear industry at the moment, um, whereas they were previously, um, and that's part of a wider geopolitical um, uh, set of issues. The National Security and Investment Act has come in, which has. Uh, change the balance somewhat, um, you know, remains to be seen how much. And also, I think there is greater public sensitivity. Um, and you talk about the ownership of iconic assets, um, the takeover of, nuclear, of Newcastle Football Club, which you could regard as an iconic asset. Whereas it has happened, but I definitely say it was not uncontroversial. So a few a few observations from the UK perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm the I'm the final obstacle between you and questions, so I'll try and keep it relatively brief. Um, so I obviously come from a very different kind of background than everybody else in the panel. I am not an academic, but I'm a journalist. I'm not a subject matter specialist in sovereign wealth funds, but the reason I'm here is that through covering asset management, I cover both the big companies that manage money on behalf of a lot of these sovereign wealth funds, and I've also happened to do some investigative work um, looking at particular sovereign wealth funds, and I'm happy to speak more about those um, if you're interested in that. Um, so a couple uh, comments that I would make. Uh, first of all, the, the comment was made that there aren't, there isn't much literature out there about sovereign wealth funds in particular. Um, both from an academic perspective um, and even from sort of more of a reporting perspective. And let me tell you why. It's because looking into a lot of these entities is like trying to reach into a black box that is biting back. Now, there's a great variety of degrees of transparency in these different kinds of institutions. So you have, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you have sort of the Norway Oil Fund, which is basically you know, a quasi passive investor tracker fund. I mean, they own the equivalent of, I think it's about 1.5% of every listed company in the world is the estimate, but their, their mandate is set by the parliament. If they wanna make any big changes to how they invest, that actually has to be approved by the government. Um, and so they're seen as a very passive investor. And then you have other entities like the Kuwait Investment Authority, which I did a big investigation into, um, and they are, a complete black box. There are no annual reports. There are no official figures that exist on how much money they even manage. And if you try and look into them, um, they are very, very resistant to you doing that. Um, yet they are also very influential players. I mean, uh, you know, the KIA is, owns, you know, city airport. It used to be, it used to own a substantial part of Thames Water. I think they might have sold out of that one. Um, you know, they're major investors in UK and US equities. Uh, they're very close to entities like BlackRock. Um, so they have a lot of influence across the political and sort of economic spectrum. So I guess the first point I'm trying to make is that um, understanding policymaker response to sovereign wealth funds also has to, a lot to do with understanding the investment style of these sovereign wealth funds. Again, a Norges bank um, 
not only because they're Norwegian and in Europe and the US that's regarded as sort of perhaps more aligned, um, is going to put, uh, set off less alarm bells um, for policymakers just because they are much more passive versus something like the KIA or especially you know the CIC, which often invests alongside other Chinese state-owned enterprises um, and does project finance that way, is going to elicit a different kind of policymaker response. Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing I would say, is, yeah, again, degree of transparency varies enormously. Um, and then there's also the question of externally versus internally man- managed mandates. So I'm sure most of you already know this here, so pardon me if I'm saying something that's very obvious, but sovereign wealth funds don't manage all of their own money. There's usually a good chunk of it that's managed internally. So like, for instance, somewhere like the KIA, two thirds of it is outsourced to other people. So you have BlackRock or Fidelity or other people, we actually don't know who all the managers are because they don't even disclose that, who actually look after the vast majority of their day-to-day investments. And then there's about a third that's managed in-house. So that also might be part of the political calculus in terms of how policymakers look at that in terms of, you know, are these direct investments? um, Are these investments that could somehow be directed politically? Or are these sort of, you know, mandates that are going through an external manager and have very little to do um, with the country and the entity they're coming from? Um, You know, CIC, 44% internal, 56% outsourced. So again, um, you know, the degree of political influence over those kinds of investment decisions will vary um enormously um the other point i would make is i know you guys were focusing mostly on equity investment um but within that there's also an enormous amount of variety in terms of how active an investor are these sovereign wealth funds so for instance again i'm taking the example of the one that i know best but a place like the kia um tends it does a lot of equity investment it only does equity fixed income and like a little bit of infrastructure real estate but Equity uh, equity investment is basically most of what they do. They tend to keep their stakes, while substantial, low enough that they're not taking board seats, and they don't tend to be, at least from most of the investors that I've spoken to who have them as sort of substantial shareholders in their companies, they're not active investors in that they're not taking meetings with management and saying, you need to run things this way, you need to run things that way. That's a very different thing than how other investors either in the private private or public sector might operate. And so again, that might also help determine how policymakers um, and politicians might respond to those kinds of investments. Um, And then I guess just two points for for the future. I mean, one thing to think about is, One thing I'm starting to hear is that sovereign wealth funds, particularly non-Western ones, um, are increasingly trying to ensure that their capital is not all managed through US firms. Um, This is part of the post-Russia sort of invasion of sanctions um, trend that we've seen where um, people want to diversify away from being very dependent on the dollar system. Again, this is early days, but I'm already hearing about um, mandates uh, for the major sovereign wealth funds being given to sort of non-Western based financial institutions because they want that diversification. So I think that's something I'm interested in in writing about, but hopefully academics are interested in looking into it as well. Um, And the other thing I think to consider is the growing allocation of institutional investors, including sovereign wealth funds, to illiquid um, investments. So things like real estate um, and, and most a lot of real estate, a lot of infrastructure, which again is something that um, a lot of Western governments, I think, are keen to uh, encourage. Again, they want that passive capital. They want that sort of long-term investment commitment. Um, but that's very different from if you're sort of buying um, equities in the stock market and that allocation is increasing. Um, so both, you know, Norges Fund is looking to increase their allocation there. I know a lot of others are as well. And that is sort of a secular trend that we're gonna see over coming years, um, which will see many of these investments deeply embedded in economies for many years to come. Um, those are the main points I wanted to make. Thanks. Our discussion comments and as team former want to add uh, respond to the comments a little bit and a little more okay so
Hello, yeah, Bernard Casey wants with this place, also at the OECD and various other places too. Um, I'm coming to this from my role as somebody who is interested in infrastructure investment. Um, I've been looking at this from the point of view of pension funds. Um, and um, I am interested in the extent to which these investors are indeed patient capital or behaving as patient capital and to what extent they're actually investing in green field as opposed to brown field infrastructure i mean buying city airport or a quarter of heathrow airport is something which is effectively already there it's a nice thing because it produces a steady income flow to somebody but it's not engaging in fundamental infrastructure development a few years ago some years ago in another room in this place i was invited to a meeting at which nick clegg was talking about how we need to get more pension funds investing in uk infrastructure and he said they don't do it enough here and then he pointed to canadian ones and australian ones but these canadian ones and australian ones were not doing the new infrastructure building they were buying the equivalents of airports so i wonder whether you can comment upon this it's not just sovereign wealth funds it's these other things as well which you talked about which are doing this thank you so how tolerant would the uk be for private investment coming from countries which are politically tenuous with the west investing in r d on emerging technologies aside from the nuclear industry such as quantum and photonics <coughs> Well, first of all, thank you so much for the insightful talk, and uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Nikita. Uh, I'm a recent alumnus of the EY. I had the pleasure of taking Robert's uh, EU uh, in World Trade course uh, last year in September. Um, and I have two questions, actually. So my first one, uh, and both of them are actually two of the authors of the book, uh, Mr. Thatcher and Dr. Vandas. Uh, so my first question would be sort of touched upon, right? You've mentioned uh, about investments primarily in the critical infrastructure in your introduction, but I was wondering, have you looked into the diversity of uh, state regimes and investment regimes uh, sector by sector? Uh, and then my second question would be more towards the definition the definition of sovereign wealth funds that was also somewhat touched upon. So how would you go about defining uh, private slash public partnership investments uh, that are made in countries where statism is the preferred form of uh, running government? So for instance, Russia or China, where the presence of the state or the party is quite prevalent in uh, a private matters. So wondering whether you took that into account or whether you just ruled it out. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Do you want to answer these three questions firstly, and then we move on to other questions? Great, yes. Uh, first of all, thanks so much to the, to, to the discussions who were very insightful and uh, constructive comments and to, to, to the audience uh, too. Uh, I, I suppose I'm going to pick up a couple of, of points that were made uh, from, 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 from both groups and then I'll let Mark pick up uh, the harder questions as always too. It was sorts of things. I hope you won't mind, Mark. Um, I, I, I thought, I mean, uh, w w one particular point to clarify, I suppose, is the difference between um, regulations and actions, right? right? So in a lot of the FDI literature, uh, including coming from economics, uh, you get these sorts of indicators that tell you the sorts of um, regulations uh, on, on, on foreign capital, right? And typically, so you have to make decisions often based on regulatory frameworks and legislation, and you code it as more or less restrictive. So what, what, one thing we, we we picked up in the case of sovereign wealth funds, which I think is, is very important in the sense that's to uh, Robert's point, is that actually it's not just a matter of uh, what you can do, it's also a matter of what you end up doing, right? So 
take France, for instance. France has all sorts of decrees starting from the early 2000s, to some extent targeted at sovereign wealth funds. And they get, in some sense, more and more restrictive on paper. Uh, but in reality, the executive is still the, the main player in town, and the executive likes these things. So typically, the economics ministry can, can get screen all sorts of things, and the list is you know, ever expanding. You have more sectors. You have more, more origins. But in the end, uh, if you look at whether or not they um, do anything about it because they like these funds, they end up not doing it. So this is not to say that legislation, and indeed, you know, the sort of growing legislative restrictions we observe are irrelevant, of course, they're relevant, uh, but they don't quite tell you the whole story in terms of how open or closed things are. I think for, for our purpose, really, what, what, what's really quite important, in a sense, is more the fact that this is happening and that this is part of a policy of recipient states to uh, use these foreign states as part of the industrial policy. And, and, and in a way, I mean, the variation over time is there for sure. And in fact, uh, at some point, we were almost done with the book. And then we felt, wow, the developments now are so significant that we need to update. <laughs> it's always the terrible thing happening at the end. We need to update everything for the last two years because so much has happened. And then it happened again and again. And at some point, we said, OK, uh, we, we need to return to normal life eventually. Uh, so now is a good time of have it. But, but, but I think. I think one thing I would say as well is it's not just needs, right? So you could imagine that, you know, if needs are very significant, uh, then automatically you have this functionalist response of the state. We need capital, therefore it comes in. Um, and, and I think for sure objective circumstances on the ground matter. But uh, if you look at what's been going on in the UK in the last two years, it's hard to conclude that economic needs and common sense always um, end up dominating uh, public policy uh, makers' decisions. And so I, I suppose this is where um, this is where the politicization comes in. And this is where the, the question of um, the ideological cleavage that you get matters, and indeed whether or not both parties are aligned or not, as uh, John correctly, uh, I think, insightfully pointed out, that you, you had this consensus in the UK for a long time, cross parties, and then uh, you know, ministries were, were, were making decisions, but over time it gets more contested, it becomes more publicly um, um, sensitive. And um, perhaps um, one, um, uh, one, one, one final um, thought from the, from the audience about the, the, um, the Norwegian, the, the Norwegian, I mean, the critical infrastructure and diversity of regimes and public private partnerships. So, one, one thing we, we find is that, I mean, especially in France, you've got all sorts of French state driven initiatives. Um, in some cases, channeling these funds to established funds that are going to do, in some cases, actual, you know, brownfield investment on the ground, so develop critical infrastructure, or indeed the banlieue plan. Uh, and sometimes they will bring they will bring private actors on board as well. So you have this kind of joint initiatives between a recipient state, a foreign state, and some selected private actors. But the, uh, uh, as you correctly pointed out, that happens more in regimes that are relatively statist, right? So the state needs to have the infrastructure in place in the UK, it's unlikely to, um, uh, to happen. And it depends also on the type of sovereign wealth funds and the transparency uh, that you have. Uh, because for instance, France has long-term alliances with the Qatari Investment Authority. They're not transparent as much as Norway, but they're not transparent in a way that Sarkozy and others found very helpful in developing certain strategies. And you know, at the end of the day, you don't know what they're doing, but you know that they're buying in return certain parts of your nuclear capabilities, defense contract, defense contracts, and everything that allows you to weave them in. So yes, um, uh, there's differences across some wind funds, but the way it plays out is not necessarily always in favor of the more transparent quote unquote, more reliable, you know, actors such as Norwegians. One final anecdote before I pass on to Mark um, is uh, as part of the House Commons committee discussions, uh, we, we had the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund head uh, uh, tell us 
uh, that in Norway he couldn't even be seen to have lunch with a minister because that would be seen as completely inappropriate. And so he said, look, we're just looking at the numbers. We have this established strategy, but we would never coordinate even with Norwegian uh, ministers, let alone any you know, foreign uh, dignitaries. <laughs> Thanks. I might follow up on this on this last point and start with it. Um, so I think what we're offering is a more politicized view about how policymakers operate. We're looking at how the executive, members of the executive, uh, obtain private benefits, private in the sense that some of them are, are, are personal, but some of them are private in the sense of they are for themselves as political actors, as policy actors. Um, so it's a you know, it's it's again a move away from seeing public policy as driven by some kind of higher interest. You've actually got to look within the state and say, what are the interests of the different actors? Um, and uh, transparency may not be very important. Uh, what really matters to members of the executive is um, are these sort of well funds investing in ways that are helpful for us uh, uh, politically? Um, uh, and uh, you know, in, in, in terms of winning elections or more often controlling or influencing particular uh, companies and sectors. Uh, and this is very, very clear in France, um, where uh, the executive has often um, uh, tried to help favoured companies uh, one example under the right was Lagardère, which was short of money. Um, and actually, the French were much more worried about the Americans coming in, hedge funds coming in, than they were about sovereign wealth funds. Um, and why was that? Because they could engage in, in exchange relationships with the Qataris, um, which involved uh, all kinds of uh, uh, deals for arms, political support, etc. Uh, and they found it much easier to deal with the Qataris than they did uh, uh, with, with, a, with a hedge fund. Um, so I think one, one, one has to, 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 to look at the, um, the interests of, of, of different actors rather than treating the state as this uh, um, uh, unitary actor that's always going to act uh, in some kind of predefined public interest. Second point that was raised um, both by Robert and by Adrian, which is, um, uh, uh, and actually by John as well in a different way, is change over time that over the last couple of years has been a kind of crackdown on foreign investment. I think that's undoubtedly true. Um, but uh, our issue is, isn't just uh, um, the extent of openness, it, it, but it's particularly whether there's discrimination against uh, uh, foreign state-owned investors. And on that, uh, uh, we find uh, uh, no evidence. Indeed, um, when the, the government uh, introduced, the UK introduced the, the latest act on, on security, um, I think it was in the white paper, it specifically said that uh, uh, there will be no discrimination against foreign state-owned investors, such as sovereign wealth funds. I mean, it's there in black and white. Um, and in a sense, uh, uh, one of the reasons for the book was, why has there been so little controversy? Why has th these kind of policy uh, been, been introduced? And it is quite, in a sense, quite remarkable. As John said, you know, having privatized uh, 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 companies, the very same companies and um, see a return of the state, but it's a, a, a foreign a foreign state investor. Um, so you know, that's, that's a kind of puzzling uh, um, issue for us, which kind of drove, it dro drove the second half of the project once we'd, once we'd found, um, once we'd uh, found our, our, our initial findings of welcome, welcoming uh, in, um, in Europe. Um, there's a whole set of questions about how these sort of, sort of world funds uh, behave, which is uh, Bernard's um, question. So we didn't, we looked a little bit, but that's not the focus of the book. Um, we were interested really in perceptions about how they behave rather than how they do behave. There's a big uh, uh, literature, there's a substantial literature in economics and business um, about how sort of world funds in, in behave. Um, there's some degree of debate, but a lot of the literature is showing that they tend to be uh, uh, patient investors. They don't, uh, as everyone said, they don't tend to take uh, um, controlling uh, stakes uh, in general. 
um, uh, but and and they tend not to not to get um, uh, openly involved. But even if you have a limited stake, if you have nine or ten percent of um, an airport or um, uh, a water company or an energy company, you're you have potentially a great, a great deal of influence. Um, the question for us really was, why was that potential not seen and not commented on? Um, now, the degree of, 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 of perception, the nature of the perception, is a highly political matter. So um, I gave the example of Dubai ports in the United States, which had virtually no coverage until these couple of senators picked it up and ran with it. Um, uh, and then it had huge coverage. Um, interestingly, a couple of weeks later, there was an engineering company called Doncasters that no one's ever heard of, um, that was sold also to the Dubai, uh, uh, in fact, the Dubai Investment Authority. Uh, so uh, this is high, high precision uh, uh, engineering, including in defense. Um, there wasn't a word about it. Why? Because uh, they had gone to uh, uh, senators, including uh, uh, Schumer, um, and Schumer actually publicly declared, he said, I'm not going to oppose this because they came to see me. So the degree of perceived threat is a political construction. Right? Uh, um, to attack the, 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 Dubai, the Dubai world uh, um, in the way that was done, you know, quite astonishing things. They, they held um, a press conference with... Uh, uh, um, uh, members of the fa of families uh, f from who, who suffered in in uh, in 11 to to condemn this purchase. I mean, Dubai uh, is not a nuclear threat, uh, uh, and uh, uh, but nevertheless, it, this was part of a campaign. So it's not to say that that what happens in reality is unimportant, but it is to say that you can have very different narratives, and those narratives can conflict. And the question is, which one wins out and why and when? Uh, in the United States, uh, uh, the narrative of foreign state investment uh, uh, being a security issue won out. Um, in uh, uh, the three European countries, the narrative that these uh, uh, investments uh, were an economic issue and that such uh, economic investment was a good thing uh, uh, won out. Last point, the definition of something well followed. So, um, I, I, I think we absolutely take the, the fact that um, supposedly private companies in uh, uh, some countries um, are state influenced, to say the least. Um, so uh, we could have brought those in, but it then becomes very difficult uh, uh, empirically to say, well, we're going to include this one, but not that one. Um, and so in the end, we had to stick with, with, a, with, with a legal definition, which is very clear. Um, uh, I would add, as, as a, as a um, perhaps as a matter of kind of skepticism, um, one could say the same thing for certain Western privately owned companies because they also have links with with the state. So it's not just a kind of non-Western uh, 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 situation in which private companies are under political influence and Western Western private companies have no political influence. It's much more subtle than that. Um, uh, and uh, as I said earlier, the, um, both the Germans and the French were much more worried about American investors than they, than they were um, uh, about um, uh, non-Western sovereign wealth funds. So they, were, they were much more dangerous. Uh, um, uh, and that had something to do with politics. The point was brought up about technology transfer. They were just as worried, if not more worried, about technology transfer to American companies than they were to to um, state uh, uh, state owned sovereign wealth funds. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much for your comments. Shall we have people one question? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a question from our online audience. Okay, so we got uh, two questions from Thomas. So uh, he asked. Do you think the openness of the UK to a sovereign will uh, funds could create the conditions for populism and political instability uh, once voters realize that they do not have sovereignty and once voters realize that there has been the sovereignty has been taken over by states? And then based on the first question, he asked. Uh, even if we are happy with the sovereign wealth funds, 
only critical infrastructure, how shall we ensure that we govern them in a proper way? Yes. And a question from our audience here? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. My question is, I don't know if this is something that emerged during the interviews, but do you think that these funds can also act as a sort of vehicle of diplomatic action? And if yes, how? Thank you. Hi, thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation and discussion. I wanted to return to a question that has already been asked, which is that in the current in the current kind of you know world after the invasion of um, of Ukraine by Russia, kind of how sustainable are these tools that the states were using in order to implement their industrial strategy? Are we kind of it seems like, for instance, in the UK, things like the son of a former KGB agent buying major national newspapers, you know, used to appear fine and now they appear naive. So are states losing kind of a tool um, for kind of deliberate economic policy in, the, in this kind of emerging uh, world order? Thanks for this great, uh, another great round of uh, online and offline questions. Um, just to pick up on, on a couple of them, um, on, on the populism question, I think, um, and something I happen to, 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 I mean, it's another hat of mine, a work on foreign populism. Uh, and in that li literature, it, it's not so much foreign investors, oddly enough, I must say, that are... Um, uh, put on the spot. So it's, it's, it's very rare indeed. In fact, there's some good studies showing that even in cases where, say, automation or um, foreign investments is responsible for layoffs in a company, um, the way it's politicized and the way it's experienced is often that people are unable to ascribe causes to the things that are generating grievances to them. Right, so they might uh, blame local immigration instead of automation. Right, so there's this misattribution of of causes. I mean, it plays both ways in the sense that for it to then become an issue, it has to be politicized, and it has to be politicized to the extent that there is a particular problem as a result, or in a way that can be linked at least uh, to these uh, sovereign wealth funds um, investing in uh, uh, countries. So if you take the UK case, it wasn't so much the DDF or Deutsche Bahn or other uh, SOEs from, you know, um, allies uh, were operating things in the country that was politically palatable. It was that uh, these um, services were seen, rightly or wrongly, as not performing the public sector duty in various kinds of ways. And that was the opening for populism. So, so that wasn't the populist question. Um, on the, the diplomatic side of it, for sure, we see that there is a quid, quid pro quo in terms of uh, long-standing relationships between states, between particular people. I mean, I mentioned the Sarkozy story of Kia early on with the QIA, the Qatari Authority. Uh, after he stepped down, he tried to set up an investment fund that was backed by the Qataris. And that was after uh, an incredibly open and a strong um, alliance between uh, Qatar and France. And you know, for those of you who remember, before France made the, the defense treaty back in the 1990s, Qatar used to be closer to, uh, to Britain in various kinds of ways. And so there's always this French-British uh, rivalry playing out in international affairs, and you see it in this case. Um, sustainability in the longer term, um, I'm sure Mark will have views on this as well. I mean, my own, my own view on this is that um, if you think of international state is basically there's this notion that you have a reconfiguration of what the state can do, its constraints and opportunities. You have this retreat of the state in some ways, at least pro forma, from the 1980s with privatization. Um, but, but then, you know, all sorts of things still need to be done. And so how do you do them, right? You do them for regulation uh, or you do them when you need money or an investor by bringing in certain private companies. Uh, fine if the domestic ones are uh, unwilling or unable or you're not allowed to, to use them or foreign states uh, for other things. And again, the, the case of France with the banlieue that they created, the plan banlieue uh, to develop, uh, you know, the, the parts of the suburbs 
with sovereign wealth funds investments. That, that's an incredible thing in a country where we used to have a public development bank doing these sorts of things for, for decades, right? But uh, and this is the EU uh, side of things with John mentioned early on. You, you had rules that you couldn't. You can do a fine state what you can't do with your own state, right? And so full circle now, why, why do I mention this? Because I think whether or not you continue to use these tools, Partly it's about the geopolitical environment, but partly it's also how much you need to use these tools um, relative to these sorts of constraints I just mentioned. Yeah, I mean, just picking up on that last point, I, I think um, the point about sovereign wealth funds is, is they are a quite disguised. So, um, uh, and you need to have someone to pick them up to make them politicized. So it doesn't just happen by accident. So, uh, you, you need political actors to, to point out what's happening. Um, I think the second point is that, that um, the sovereign wealth funds have often stepped in when private actors wouldn't want to. Um, so if one thinks of the Barclays Bank issues, the Barclays was in deep trouble. Um, and they, they turned to the, the Qataris. Um, so now, why they did so may be a mystery. Everyone will know better than I do. No? Maybe, maybe it has something to do with the fact they're getting political support or arms or various other things. Um, but um, uh, if anything, the, the sovereign wealth funds come in and um, when others don't, and they make losses on things. Um, so, uh, but that may well be because there's a different kind of exchange. Um, relationship um, and or because their time horizons are different. Um, there are a lot of private funds are their time horizon is three months. You can't even finish a book in three months. Um, so if, if, if we if we be under that kind of pressure, we would never got anywhere. Um, so it, it, it's it, they're not necessarily either objectively bad things. And even subjectively, in the way they're looked at, that they may be very helpful. Um, in terms of, and that also I think go, go, goes to um, Maria's point about um, diplomatic action. It, uh, in many of these countries, um, the, the state is just an owner; it is highly uh, uh, linked. So when I went to Kuwait, I went to the Kuwait Investment uh, Authority. It's fascinating because they were at one level in the finance ministry in the same the same courtyard, just above them. Um, uh, no, they're not. They're not. A, there's there maybe a degree of separation, but it's quite it's quite limited. Um, when you when you look at the, who sits on them, you, know, you can see it's, it's the brother of X or some some um, <laughs> relationship. So you know, and on the western side, I mean, again, I think it's very important for us not not to to have this. Um, sharp division between you know, the West is like this and the non-West is like this. We've used those terms because they're useful labels, but you know, Western companies are highly politicized and links between diplomacy and private companies are equally highly present uh, uh, in Western countries. Uh, when um, uh, leaders of, of governments go to uh, uh, the Middle East or elsewhere, they take a, a, a top uh, uh, executives from supposedly private firms, uh, and they go along uh, uh, all together. And there's a package deal, one way or another, which involves uh, arms and orders and investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It may not be explicit, but it's certainly part of uh, an overall kind of package. Um, then, curious question about how sustainable this is. So, th this is a, a, a obviously a kind of fa fascinating issue about um, whether or not. Uh, there's going to be a re-securitization of, of some of these issues. Um, so uh, I can't re read, I don't have a crystal ball, not yet anyway. Um, uh, but it certainly seems that security has gone up uh, uh, greatly in terms of uh, priorities. The question will then be, um, so there may be a, a narrowing of opportunities for foreign investors. The question I think for interest, that's interesting for us is, will there be necessary discrimination against um, uh, state-owned firms? 
Um, and also whether there's going to be discrimination in key industries uh, uh, against uh, foreign investors, private or public, including other Western investors. Because uh, it's, it's very clear that faced with uh, the Ukraine crisis, countries have very different priorities. Uh, the, the degree of conflict between Germany, on the one hand, and France and Italy about energy subsidies, or issues about becoming dependent on the Americans, uh, are uh, th these are di divisive issues, um, and that and that's not new. Um, in the two thousand eight financial crisis, uh, banks uh, uh, rapidly withdrew from uh, overseas countries. So uh, um, you know, we, 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 there may well be a move to try and renationalize certain kind of key sectors, uh, and energy is is is, is clearly one of them. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and th then I suppose um, policymakers have a choice. Would they, would they prefer a private investor with whom they have certain kinds of relationships, or would they prefer an, an overseas private investor? Would they prefer an overseas state investor who may be more predictable uh, or with, with whom they can, or to whom they can offer different kinds of advantages and different kinds of exchange relationships? Um, and that's and that's not clear yet. Thanks a lot for your comments, Tim and Mark, and thanks a lot for our audience questions, which are very uh, great. So I guess we have to stop here. It was like excellent event. Thank you all for being here, for our like our audience both in line online here and thanks again for our excellent speakers. And the very last important thing about the book how can you get this excellent book you can order the book from our official LAC events independent bookshop pages of uh, hand uh, and you can also find a link to the book on the event page and it has been pasted on the zoom chat as well okay great thank you